And for folks that are um, may have been in part of the other session, welcome back. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Thank you in advance to the interpreters. I will continue to do my best to keep a good pace. But if I'm not, please feel free to just, you know, message me and tell me to slow it down, but I will do my best to, to, do, to keep it at a good pace. All right. So again, welcome, welcome. So glad you're here. So it is my goal to have an interactive conversation. And so I am going to offer a couple of ways for you to engage with the content and see ways where you can apply it to your own work. So in this particular conversation, there will be opportunities for self-reflection, large group discussion. So if you want to take yourself off of mute, let me just let somebody learn, um, take yourself off of mute and join the conversation, please feel free to do that. And just like I said in the other call, um, we're not really going to do action planning because we only have two hours. And, you know, when I think about facilitation, even when we have all day to be with people, to just give so much information and then just quickly shift into, okay, what are we going to do about it, right? That is a part of the power structure that I am trying to not replicate, right? And so I really want to give the information. It is a lot of information. And then I'm gonna just leave you with a couple of questions at the very end to think about and to answer as this, you know, as this particular conversation ends, right? So there won't be this rush to try to make sense of everything that I'm saying. Particularly with a conversation like this, we need to be able to ease into these conversations. So that is really my goal. So I think that you all have already begun to put information in the chat. Um, but if you have not, and you want to share your name and one thing that you are excited about. And if you have not put your gender pronoun um, next to your name in the Zoom, then you can go ahead and enter it in here. My preferred pronouns are she and her. All right, so your name, your pronoun, and one thing you're excited about. So this afternoon, earlier this afternoon, when I started, when I did this conversation with the advocates, I was excited about the sun. Um, but now the sun has gone down after having it beam on me and uh, for two hours while I was talking, now I'm actually excited that it's a little cool. <laughs> So, so that's what I'm excited about. And um, I think I'm gonna have pancakes for dinner. So I'm excited about that too. So let's see what's happening in the chat. Rochelle Scoggins, thank you, welcome, welcome. And so you can feel free to put the information in at any time. Hope you're helping your parents close on their house this afternoon. Well, that's exciting. That's exciting. Excited about your garden and how enjoyable it is to be in it. Good for you. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, happy birthday in advance. We love it. We love a birthday around here. I hope that you celebrate the entire month of June. You deserve it. All right. So let's get into the conversation. So I'm going to start with this um, quote by Grace Lee Boggs. So I do like to incorporate different videos and things like that into my conversation because one, I just feel like it makes for a richer conversation than just me talking all the time. Um, I like to bring in lots of different voices and obviously Grace Lee Boggs, I mean, is just a perfect person to hear from. And we have folks that are saying they're excited to be here with us. They're excited for making, to have salmon for dinner. That sounds amazing. Somebody else is making travel plans, as am I. I'm actually going to the Gullah Islands with my mother in a couple of weeks. So that's gonna be very exciting. I haven't had a vacation in a very long time. And folks are excited for tomatoes and peppers and just things growing in the garden. So lots of growers, I love it. Thank you. 
All right. So let's get into um, Gracie Bonds. So I only show snippets of the videos, right? So so you'll you'll see me fast forwarding quite a bit. Gracie Bonds is and actually I'm going to try to play this on YouTube so that we can have our Bonds is a 92 year old activist. This one doesn't have captioning. That's maybe because it's so old. Okay, we're not gonna that. I'll come back to it. So I want to just take a moment and have you all think about leadership. Thinking about what does it mean to lead, what scares you about being a leader, and what excites you. So I'd love for you all to just take a moment. If you want to close your eyes as we go through this short grounding exercise, let your shoulders drop. Everything is an offering. It's totally up to you. But you, know, you might not have had a breather yet today. So this is your opportunity to have a little breather if you haven't already. So go ahead and let your shoulders drop. Let your body be heavy. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Exhaling it out through the mouth. Seeing if you can let your shoulders drop even more. We carry so much stress in our shoulders. Maybe moving your neck from side to side around in a circle, maybe lifting your shoulders up to your ears and letting them drop. Lifting them up again to your ears and letting them drop. Any back in your chair, or whatever you're sitting in. And just think about what it means to me, what that means to you. And what scares you about being a leader? And if there is, you know, a little fear around leadership, where are you feeling that in your body? Are you feeling it in your belly, your chest? Again, in the shoulders, maybe taking some time to just massage that area. Giving yourself some love for showing up anyway. And thinking about what excites you. And where do you feel that? Taking a deep breath in, focusing on what excites you. Exhaling out. And you can either Put in the chat what scares you, what excites you. Maybe nothing scares you at all. <laughs> Maybe nothing excites you at this point. <laughs> but you can put it in the chat or if you have your you know, device handy, maybe taking a quick note on your phone or jotting something down if you have pen and paper handy. What excites you about being a leader? Making mistakes is scarier as a leader. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Everybody looking to us for the answers. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Everybody has something to say about leaders. Okay. Offending people 
feeling like you need to have the answer right always. The joy of mentoring and clinical discussions is exciting. You can make an impact, you can create change. What's scary is responsibility and letting somebody down. Absolutely, absolutely. It excites me to help staff grow and develop and build more passion in the field, but it's often very lonely and hard to grow. Absolutely, yep. The opportunity to make institutional change, doing it wrong and doing it publicly. That's right, that's right. Moving our program in a newer direction that we haven't done before. Is that exciting and scary or one or the other? Excited to work on team building. Yeah, exciting. Thank you, Laura. Fear, missing an unintended injury and not being able to address the issue. Yeah, thank you all so much. So, you know, because I also do healing work and I do somatic work, right? So just keying into where your excitement is and just see if you can allow that feeling to move all through your body, right? Knowing that you can reaccess it anytime. So whether you're in a meeting, you know, things are getting heavy, just taking a moment to yourself and breathing through it, right? Even in this conversation, if things start to feel heavy or you start to feel fearful, just breathing into that excitement right? Seeing if you can connect back to that feeling of excitement when things get tough. That's what helps me to continue to do the work. So thank you to the folks that entered um, information into the chat. So I always like to, to lay a framework when I talk about race, right? So I start with the foundational concepts. And this is for you know, anybody who wants to take snippets of this conversation, or if folks are wanting to talk about race themselves, you know, lots of people say they don't know what to say. I always start with the foundational concepts, right? So one of the foundational concepts is the idea of equality, equity, and liberation, right? So here we are, 2021, everybody's talking about equity right now, right? Before folks were talking about equality, which is an interesting first step right? Everyone can see the game. Obviously, everybody does not have the same access to it. So now here we are moving into this world of equity, which means the person who might not need the box or need the extra thing to help them see the game, they give it to the person who is smaller, who needs it, right? So everyone can see the game now, right? Liberation is what excites me. That's what excites me in my personal life. That's what excites me when working with survivors and having these conversations. How can we move towards liberation? With all of the structures, all of the things that we have, how can we really move to a space where there is no wall, right? And we can all see the game. We don't need anybody's you know, actual help to do it because we all have access. Put this in the trash. Thank you. When we talk about institutional racism, the term was first coined in 1967 by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. And so Carmichael and Hamilton, they wrote that while individual racism is often identifiable because of its overt nature, institutional racism is less perceptible because of its less overt and far more subtle nature, right? So institutional racism originates in the operation of established and respected forces in the society. And so because of that, it receives far less public condemnation than individual racism. So of course this was written in 1967, and now we are at a time when many more people are talking about institutional racism, structural racism, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then the actual term of racism itself, which I purposefully leave out of these discussions because the definition of it is actually being changed back to what it was when I was in sociology class. Um, over the years, it seemed like racism and discrimination 
began to get commingled and watered down a bit. And so folks stopped talking about the actual structural pieces of racism in the racism conversation. And so last year, the events of last year um, prompted a young woman of color to actually reach out to Webster and let them know, hey, this definition of racism is incomplete. It is not the original definition of racism. And so they agreed, they said, you know what, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting when it happened, it happened, I would say I started to notice it around the early 90s, um, when again, racism and discrimination were like co-mingled. It was just really interesting what was also happening politically when the definition of racism started to get watered down. So one of the things I said was until they come out with the actual definition of what racism really is, I'm not using it in my trainings. So the other thing about institutional racism is it is how this country functions. It is woven into housing, healthcare, political power, education, et cetera. And that was my addition onto their definition of institutional racism. So on to structural racism. So according to Keith Lawrence and Terry Kelleher, they said that structural racism is the most profound and pervasive form of racism and all other forms of racism, i.e. institutional, interpersonal, internalized, et cetera, emerge from structural racism. And so structural racism encompasses the entire system of white supremacy. It is diffused and infused in all aspects of society, including our history, culture, politics, economics, and our entire social fabric. So I also don't use the language of white supremacy. It is here because I'm quoting people, but in my own life, um, I am using other language like um, white imperialism, white terror, things like that, but not white supremacy. I'm always pulling apart words, which you'll see in a minute. <laughs> so then out of this structural piece, out of this institutional piece, we have implicit bias. So if we think about things, if we think about a tree, right, we could say that the imperialism and terror would be the root of the tree. And then we would have things like, which I'm sure that many of you all already know this, gender-based violence, right? Sexual assault, implicit bias, all of these things would be the branches, right? They would be what the outgrowth, the branches, the leaves, the this, the that, from that original root. So we're gonna talk a little bit about white privilege. So we have Robin DiAngelo here, the author of White Fragility. I don't know if folks in, the, um, in this conversation are reading this book or have read this book. If you are, please um, put a one in the chat so I could just know where folks are. I know that there's a lot of folks, you know, um, different book clubs and things like that that are happening now. Let's see who's reading. Lots of folks reading White Fragility. Excellent. There's another book called White Rage um, by an African-American woman that I have on my dresser. I have to go look and see um, who it's actually written by because I can't remember off the top of my head. But that's another really good one is White Rage. Okay, so a, folk, a few folks, great. So um, Robin DiAngelo, there's some really interesting key points that she makes in this video that anybody could do to anybody else. And if you did those acts, you were a bad. But unfortunately, what it morphed into is make it impossible for... And so prior to the civil rights movement, it was fairly socially acceptable for white people to just come out and say, we are superior. My father certainly was comfortable saying that. The great joke of Archie Bunker and all of the family was that he wasn't up with the times and he was still saying um, things that conveyed this idea. But post-civil rights, it became bad to be racist, right? It became unacceptable to be racist. And that seems like a positive thing, right? Racism is bad. But unfortunately, what it morphed into is make it impossible for white people to look at racism because what we hear is, I would have to be a bad person in order to perpetuate racism. It became a moral issue. 
In addition to years of reflection and study of my own racial identity and how it shapes my life and my experience and my perspectives, I've had the very rare opportunity to, for a living, day in and day out, lead primarily white groups of people in discussions of race and racism. And there are some very, very predictable patterns that come up in these conversations. And as I listen to these, it's almost like a script, right? That like, it's almost as if as white folks, would, we just pick up this script and we say the same things again and again and again. And as a sociologist, rather than seeing something that's patterned as meaning therefore it's true, I look at something patterned as, as very revealing of how we get socialized to see things and to see the world. And then the next question that follows that is, and so how does that function? Right? And when we look around us, we can see that although we have changes since the civil rights movement and we have this idea of racism being bad, we still have the same unequal outcomes by race. By every measure, we have racial inequality. So how do we have such different narratives than we had prior to the civil rights movement and still have unequal outcomes? And as I listen to white folks, my group, um, repeat these narratives over and over, I got this image of a dock, like a pier, and it's just floating on the water, and that's all the superficial things that we say. And you probably recognize some of these, you hear them, maybe you've said them yourself. I don't see color. I was taught to treat everybody the same. I don't care if you're pink, blue, purple, polka dotted. My parents weren't racist. That's why I'm not racist. Or my parents were racist. That's why I'm not racist. It doesn't really matter what goes in front of it. The answer is always, I'm not racist. I know people of color. I used to work uh, in the military. All of the things we say to rationalize um, that we ourselves are not complicit in this system. Now, I want to speak to two of these before I kind of take us below the surface of the dock. And one is this idea that our parents taught us to treat everyone the same. And I'm just going to put it out there like this. No, they didn't. That is not humanly possible. Human beings are not objective. You cannot be taught to treat or to see everyone the same. And when you say that, you're indicating that you don't understand how socialization works, which is actually a positive thing in the sense that that can direct what you would need to focus on if you want to get deeper understanding. The other one I want to speak to is this common trope of, I don't care if you're pink, purple, polka dotted. If that's in your vocabulary, I would urge you to please drop it and never say it again. Although it isn't intentional, it's actually very demeaning. People don't come in those colors. And what it conveys is that you're not prepared to engage with authenticity. And that's why I have this image of a dock, right? That's very superficial surface. And for me, in trying to understand how all this works, what it means to be white um, and live so separate by race, even though I have was taught to see myself individually as open-minded and outside of all of this, I've had to go under the surface. And that's why I have this image here now of under the water, you see the pier, the pillars or posts that prop up the surface. Okay. So for example, it's very common in, in discussions of race to have white people tell you about all the people of color in their lives, right? Oh, I have these co-workers, or my best friend, or my second cousin married a black man, or all of the ways that we want everyone to know that we have relationships with people of color, okay? And so we're giving you evidence, right? When someone gives you, tells you that, they're giving you evidence. And so what are they giving you evidence of? They're giving you evidence that because they love people of color, know and love people of color, they can't be racist, which means they see racism as conscious dislike or explicit bias or hatred, right? And that's, they're communicating to you that they don't have conscious dislike or hatred as evidenced by all of these people in their lives. And what we don't understand is the power of implicit bias. Most bias is unconscious. And that makes it very, very dangerous because it drives our behaviors, but we're not aware of it. Yes, it's wonderful to have people of color in your life if you're white. Many, many, many people, white people, don't have people of color in close relationships. But that doesn't mean your life is free of racism. That doesn't mean you don't have a white experience or a white perspective. And it also doesn't mean that racism will not surface in relationships with people of color.
So if we go underneath and we look at the pillars that are supporting that kind of superficial ways that we're taught to think about racism, we see individualism as a very powerful prop or support, this idea that each of us is unique and outside of socialization. We see universalism, which is kind of the opposite of individualism. Individualism says, why can't we all be different? And universalism says, why can't we all be the same? This is a very popular ideology in, in religious or faith communities. And I'm not arguing that on a deep spiritual level, we're not all universally the same, but we don't live, if you will, in the spiritual realm. We live in the physical realm. And here in the physical realm, we have to ask ourselves, how does it function to say, functions to take race off the table, to take power off the table, to deny that we have fundamentally different experiences because racism is real. And while race isn't real, in other words, at the biological level, there is no real true race or racial difference as we're, we're taught to um, understand it, these very superficial signifiers of racial difference that um, allow us to categorize people, these are very real in their consequences for people's lives. And this insistence that we're all one doesn't allow us to engage with that social reality. I try to help white people see how race functions in our lives. And I try to move us away from the really um, obvious evident examples such as a racist joke or a racist action or you know things that would be recognizable to everybody right the kinds of acts that cause people like me well-meaning people like me to say i couldn't possibly be racist i don't do those things and i try to help white people understand racism as the very fabric of our society and I think the most profound example of everyday racism is segregation, that most white people live in racial segregation. While we may work with people of color, when we go home, people of color are rarely at our dinner table. And I don't mean setting our table. I mean sitting and breaking bread with us, true relationships in our lives. Many people can recognize the explicit kind of conscious dislike type of racism, racist jokes, racist expressions, the KKK. But I want to speak to, I want to help white people see the everyday racism that's embedded and that we participate in. And I want to look at neighborhood and school segregation as an example. I'm going to start with this app here. These are the app's founders. It's a new app called The Sketch Factor. And what it does is when you go to a new city, you can put in where you are and it tells you which neighborhoods to avoid because they're sketchy. And of course, sketchy is very much associated with race and class in, in the white mind. And so now we have the convenience of segregation through an app. We don't actually have to talk to other white people about, you know, where are the good neighborhoods and the bad neighborhoods. And that good neighborhood, bad neighborhood, good schools, bad schools discourse is an example of new racism. I don't think it, it gets by anybody that that is racially coded language. So this way we can come out and police those racial boundaries without ever kind of naming race. But we all know what we're talking about. And I think the most profound way that my life has been shaped by my race is through the power of segregation. Most white people do live in segregation. We choose that segregation. And in a lot of ways, we celebrate it. What makes a school good and what makes a neighborhood good? Well, the absence of people of color. That is the way that white people measure the value of their neighborhoods and schools. And while we don't come out and name that, we all know what it is. And so I have had to think very deeply on what it means to have grown up in a primarily white neighborhood, to be born into, to go to school, to study, to learn, to play, to worship, to love, to work, and to die in segregation and not have one single person who loved, mentored, or guided me 
convey that there was any loss. And I'm going to repeat that because I think it's very profound and I really want us to sit with it. That I can live my whole life in segregation. In fact, if I follow the trajectory that my loving parents laid out for me in my good neighborhood and my good school and my good college and my good career in which I would ideally rise to the top, I could easily never have any consistent, ongoing, authentic relationships with people of color. And not one person who guided me ever conveyed that there was loss. Just sit with that for a moment. That there is no inherent value in the perspectives or experiences of people of color. And so I could have just, you know, and I say this all the time, I could have just used that little snippet there when she talks about going through her whole life and in a completely white world, right? And, but I just always, I feel like it's important for her, you know, to, to give her a little bit more of the storytelling piece, right? Before we get up to that piece. But I feel like that is the most crucial piece is the extent to which we are still living for the most part in segregated places. And so I don't know if these are things that you all think about. I don't know, you know, what your neighborhoods look like or where your programs are located, or if you think about, you know, those things. Um, but I think that it's so important for this inherent value piece when it comes to implicit bias, right? And the perspectives of people of color. And I think about the brilliant women of color that I've worked alongside for 20 years in this movement and myself included, and the way that they and myself have been pushed out of organizations or silenced in meetings or our work just going um, unrecognized, you know, for so many years. And, and how I've watched my colleagues, who my white colleagues who were not as brilliant as them rise and make more money and become executive directors and become managers because of this thing called value, right? In the same way that our movement looks at patriarchy, right? The same way women identified people don't obviously make as much as most you know, male identified folks, right? And these are the things that I've watched in this movement for the past 20 years. And so that piece about value, whose knowledge is important, whose knowledge is cited, whose perspective is important, whose voice gets raised up in meetings, right? Who gets silenced in meetings? These are things as you all think about your leadership, right? Are you working towards liberation in your program or are you replicating more of the same? Or are you feeling kind of stuck, right? These are just things for you all to think about. So obviously in her talk, she's talked a little bit about the granted privilege or a lot about granted privilege actually. And so that's all the privileges that are granted by the society to members of the privilege group. And then the internalized privilege, the expectations, the assumptions of superiority and entitlement internalized by members of that group, right? And so one of the things about privilege so most of us at this point, I feel like know what white privilege is on a certain level, but I don't know if we really talk about speaking in universals enough in our work. And so speaking in universals is where the dominant culture's perspective, language, ways of being, cultural cues and expectations are the ones that matter, just like what she said in her talk. And so therefore the dominant culture gets to create the descriptors, the qualifiers of communities that are most often incorrect, inaccurate, and dangerous, right? And so again, you know, I said it in the other talk, I'll say it here, celebrities always give me so much, uh, so many things to talk about on so many levels. And um, this particular interaction with Cheryl Underwood and Sharon Osborne, which I think was last month, um, was just another example of the granted privilege and internalized privilege. So for those of you all that don't know, uh, one, of Cheryl Under, uh, one of Sharon Osborne, the wife of Ozzy Osborne's friend, Pierce Morgan, was accused of being a racist. 
Sharon came to his defense and said he was not racist, right? But this interaction happened because Cheryl asked Sharon if she could understand why people might think that he was racist, okay? And this was the reaction that Cheryl got. And I'm sure, if, again, you could put a one in the chat if you all have seen this. I'd love to see, you know, if I'm the only one who's obsessed with pop culture, but um, let's see, as a teaching tool, right? So I let's see. would like to know, because I've been knowing you for years, so I've been here, and I've never seen anything come out of you other than if I don't know, I'm willing to learn. If it comes off a certain way, I stand corrected. Right. That's the only thing I say. Yeah. So what would you say to people who may feel that you, while you're standing by your friend, it appears that you give validation or safe haven to something that he has uttered that is racist? Okay, so I just wanted to give you all the context that Cheryl was talking about, okay? So now I'm going to get into the reaction to that question. I would be racist about anybody or anything in my life. How can I? Well, 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 well what? We will be right no back. Watch. We have more topics, so don't go away. And I think we don't should go. stop this. I will ask you again, Cheryl. Yes. I've been asking you during the break. I'm asking you again. And don't try and cry, because if anyone should be crying it should be me this is the situation yeah. you tell me where you have heard him say educate me tell me when you have heard him say racist things and educate me tell me so i stop it there because there's so many things that are problematic obviously one cursing your co-workers out at work on television <laughs> is the obvious piece about it, right? But the other thing to me is this educating piece, like, and the piece of the privilege here for me is Sharon Osborne, a very wealthy English lady, um, addressing this dark-skinned African-American woman, right, um, from humble beginnings, and again, dehumanizing her, telling her she doesn't have the right to cry as a dark-skinned black woman which we'll talk about colorism in a minute this is a just a real-time example of what privilege looks like so dehumanizing her and then at the same time demanding that she educates her which is so often the place that women of color find themselves in not just from white people but folks other people of color as well and and gender so i when Clubhouse first came out, I was on Clubhouse for folks who know what that is. Great. So I would be in a lot of these rooms and um, with men of color, and they were conversations about sexism. And much in this same way, these men were demanding that Black women in particular educate them about sexism. And they actually said, this is your job. You have to deal with us. You have to educate us. That is privilege. In the same way that people of color did not create the system of racism, in the same way that women identified people did not create sexism, yes, we might take part in internalized um, racist response or internalized sexist response. We did not create these things, right? So demanding from the people that are most impacted that they teach you about it. Something that she actually benefits from every single day is privilege. The other piece of this, because there's so many pieces, um, is, gosh, there's so many pieces. So the educating piece, and then again, telling her that she cannot cry is problematic, but this is also devaluing what she's saying right? Devaluing her ideas, her perceptions, what she says does not matter, right? Denying that she's racist much in the same way that Robin D'Angelo talked about. So for me, this is just a perfect real-time example of white privilege. The other piece of it, and Cheryl Underwood talks about it, and, and, and most of the Black women that I know that talked about this, um, one of the reasons that Cheryl said that she started to cry was that she knew she could not respond in the way that she wanted to respond. Because if she responded any other way, 
like meeting Sharon with the same energy that she was getting, she could have instantly been looked at as the angry black woman. And so she knew that. So even as she was being attacked, she could not respond, right? Because again, because of the place of having less value. And that is speaking in, also speaking in universals, right? Sharon's perspective is important. Pierce's perspective is important. Nobody else's perspective is important, right? What this looks like in our work. So we have this definition here of underserved communities, right? <clears throat> and it says those communities in which people lack arts programs, services, or resources due to geograph geography, economic conditions, cultural background, socioeconomic status. So I'll ask you all, and you can put it in the chat, <clears throat> or you can take yourself off mute. What's missing from this definition? Yes, the historical and current oppression, absolutely. And the why, yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I'm sure that I've used this definition, like I've used the term, I mean, underserved communities when I wrote grants and things like that, absolutely, 100%. But this is the definition that is out here and there's no why, right? This is speaking in universals. So, but what's also missing is the who. Who are those communities in which people, what people? So now we get to assume, right? And what I would say is if the people aren't identified, then they can be erased, right? We just lump those communities. Oh, those communities over there, they are underserved. What communities? Who are these people, right? That lack arts programs, services or resources due to geography, economic conditions. So geography, how, how did they get it to that geographic location? Was it by choice? Was it because of redlining? Okay, let's see. Uh, Heinz says also what is present but does not add to communities, i.e. liquor stores and pawn shops. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Economic conditions. Do people want to be in those economic conditions or are they economic conditions that they found themselves in because maybe they are gender non-conforming or trans and can't get a quote unquote regular job. So they found themselves in a certain economic condition. Cultural background, is their cultural background the issue or is it how people view their culture that locks them out, right? So. And then socioeconomic status, the same thing, right? Where is the why in all of this? And so again, this is the benefit of speaking in universals, right? You can just throw out a definition like this and we all pick it up, run with it, use it because we don't have any other language because we don't get to create language. And then organizations get money, right? based on definitions that don't even adequately represent the people that they are supposed to be serving. Some other ways it shows up in our work, right? So no understanding when there's the conflict between content, which is the agenda of the meeting or and the process, people's need to be heard or engaged. I have definitely been in meetings when I worked in coalitions and I've worked at four, um, where we had to just keep moving because of what was on the agenda. There's no time for processing. There's no time to make sure everybody understands everything. There's just a moving forward, moving forward. And this comes from the white, what white supremacist, uh, aspects of a white supremacist organization. That's, um, I pulled some of these from there. And then all resources directed towards producing measurable goals right? It's all about the deliverables. It's all about checking boxes. There's one right way to do things, hierarchical in nature. But this thing about perfectionism is something that I really want to key into, particularly as it comes to leadership, particularly as it comes to our work. Because I, like I said, I've been doing a lot of these trainings, particularly this last period of time, and everybody is afraid of doing things wrong. And myself included, when I worked at 
coalitions. There was always a crisis. There was always a fear of doing everything wrong. And so often I would say this movement is violent. You know, <laughs> how is it that I work in the domestic violence movement and I'm literally fearful walking into the office, right? This is how the privilege shows up. And so how are people supposed to learn and grow and have these hard conversations if people think that everything has to be perfect? And so one of the other pieces is the ability to opt in and opt out of these conversations, right? Not participating, being an observer, right? As a Black woman, I have to participate in these conversations. You know, I... I actually like having these conversations, which is probably something weird about me, but, but it's just interesting to me when people are on these calls, they don't have their camera on, they don't participate. That is a function of white privilege. And so often it's because they're afraid of saying something wrong, but it's also just because they have the, they have the privilege to show up or not, right? And also fear of open conflict. So ignoring issues, or passive aggressive behavior being the norm, right? And so any behaviors that are outside of that are looked at as problematic or they are pathologized. And we also see that in shelter, right? Survivors of all race and ethnic groups who don't fit specific ways, who don't present in, certain, in specific ways are so often exited out one of the things I used to do when I worked with shelters is we used to do trainings on conflict resolution and exiting people in versus exiting people out. And, you know, we used to do this exercise where we would take the power and control wheel and, and put it on the ground. And, and maybe you all have done this too. And we would have people draw the power and control wheel and then they'd have to write in how the shelter rules um, fit the power and control wheel. I don't know if you all did that, but I'd love to know if, uh, if you all had the opportunity to do that exercise because we used to do that all the time. So this other thing is proximity to whiteness or being white adjacent. And so that is a black indigenous person of color that might receive some of the same benefits as a white person, right? And white adjacent people from marginalized communities, they're often in higher positions of power and in institutions and sometimes become gatekeepers in their own communities. So for me, I definitely am a person that has benefited from white adjacency. I grew up in the suburbs. I moved there when I was five years old. I went to uh, all girls private college in Massachusetts before moving to Atlanta in my 20s. So I had a very... Um, white adjacent life <laughs> before I got into my 20s. And, and I know that that has helped me in some ways. And so I have to be careful that I don't become a gatekeeper to my own community. I constantly have to check myself because growing up in an environment like that, there was implicit bias that I had, right? Growing up that I had to unlearn. And so again, so this is just the appetizer. I love food. So we're gonna just talk about this in terms of food, right? So we're still in the foundational concepts. So this is the appetizer still, right? Maybe we've had a glass of wine by now, right? So misogynoir is another foundational concept. And misogynoir, is the very specific kind of misogyny that is directed at Black women in particular. And it provides a racialized nuance that mainstream feminism does not. So again, for me, when I came into this work in 2000, I definitely thought we were all in this together. I had very little understanding. I didn't even know that I that I was a survivor of domestic violence, first of all, until I you know, came to work at the coalition and started reading things and was like, oh my gosh, like there's a name for what I experienced, right? There's a reason why I experienced what I experienced. And so it took me a while to see misogynoir play out the way that it plays out in this movement, right? 
Well, I added some components to misogynoir because Moya, when she coined the term, she really talks about how it plays out in pop culture. And, but I was interested in what it looks like in our everyday life. And so one aspect is styles that are unacceptable when worn by black women are celebrated when worn by white women. So I talked about in the other conversation, when I entered the working world, you know, we had our interview hair, which is, you know, a professional bob, professional in quotation marks, or a bun or something like that. And then once we passed our 30, 60, 90 day probation, that's when we broke out our braids. That's when, you know, if we if weaves were around for some people at that time, um, that's when that, that would come out, right? Because we knew that we couldn't be fired or not hired for wearing our hair natural. That has let up a little bit, but all of these screenshots are from last year. So on my on the left here, these are all instances of Black children being either suspended or discriminated against. And this is from the UK. This is in Texas. The, in New York, they actually passed the Crown Act to prevent children from being penalized for wearing the hair that grows naturally outside, you know, out of their head, um, right? And so the fact that we had to have an act passed to stop our children from being discriminated against in schools as of last year is problematic. While at the same time, also last year, last August, as a matter of fact, on Pinterest, it says braids on white girls is the new trend, right? 18 pictures of adorable braids rocked by your favorite celebrities, right? And so this is what misogynoir looks like, whether it's the shape of our bodies, which was looked at as problematic until J-Lo had it, whether it was our lips, which many of us got made fun of and were bullied because of, and, but now we know people pay thousands of dollars to have those same lips. So this is what misogynoir is, devaluing everything about Black people, but those same features on everybody else are great, right? So ghetto on Black people, you know, uh, what do they call it? Um, wonderful on everybody else or exotic on other people, right? That is misogynoir. Another aspect of misogynoir is painting Black people as unattractive, as animalistic. So you have this person here on the right, he was a newscaster on Univision, and he said on television that Michelle Obama looked like she could be in the movie, The Planet of the Apes. You have a professor in London who actually did a study, and I remember that study, to figure out why Black women were the least attractive of all other racial and ethnic groups. And then you have photos like this of Iman. There's another one here, top corner of um, Naomi Campbell. This ad campaign was called Call of the Wild. So always linking Black people back to the jungle, right? Dehumanizing. Then we have the angry Black woman trope. So we have this caricature of Venus, um, sorry, um, Serena Williams on the left that was done all through their career. They've been caric caricatured in this way as angry, you know, when they've spoken to refs. Meanwhile, people like John McEnroe and things like that are, are, are lifted up as heroes, right? And John McEnroe himself even came out and criticized Serena and Venus early on in their career. I used to only show the picture of her jumping up and down with the, with the pacifier, but I felt like it was important to show this other photo of her as being who she is, you know, a mom, a human being. And so this is a very damaging trope. We see this in the courts with survivors of color, if they speak up for themselves, we see this when law enforcement comes to domestic violence to the door, right? If women of color speak up, they are not believed. So we see this over and over in our work, being portrayed as angry, as having an attitude. And even myself, when I first started doing these conversations, again, because I get super passionate, 
you know, I would be questioning myself in this conversation. Like, oh, do people think I'm bitter? Oh, do people think I'm angry? And even when I work in mainstream organizations as well, you know, having to censor myself in the same way that Cheryl Underwood did, right? Because we don't want to be perceived as being angry. And that is women identify people in general, right? The world has a problem with women being angry. <laughs> so why should we consider this in our work? Well, one of the things we know is that doctors perceive black people, I said black women, but they need, but but it's really black people as a whole as having a higher pain threshold. And so they are treated differently. And there are studies that were done with doctors where they actually said they do not feel that black people felt pain in the same way as other people, which is one of the reasons why we were not prescribed op opioids in the large numbers, which is one of the reasons why the opioid epidemic has not disseminated the Black community. It's because the doctors did not give us the drugs. We also know that the maternal mortality rate for Black women is three times higher than for white women in the United States. And uh, again, a lot of that has to do with racial bias in the healthcare system, right? And because of the stereotype of the strong Black woman, many Black women know that they are not allowed to experience or really show emotion, pain, or distress because we're often not believed or ridiculed. And so one of the things that we know is that culture is gonna shape the individual's experience of violence. Culture is going to shape the batterer's response to intervention and color is gonna shape access to other services that might be crucial for the victim. And so I hear a lot of folks saying that these kinds of conversations interrupt our work of domestic violence and they constantly talk about mission drift. And I would argue because we know the numbers of you know, who's, who's being affected the most by domestic violence homicide, who's being sexually assaulted the most, it's women of color, black women, Latinx women, native women, right? Immigrant women, refugee women. And so if we are not having these conversations regularly, but not just conversations, if we are not changing our policies and our structures, then we are not serving everyone and we need to really stop saying that, right? This is a part of our work. These conversations and change is a part of our work, right? So now we move to the current landscape. Can you believe all that was the appetizer? My goodness. Okay, so now, now we're at the meal. So one of the things that I had the honor of doing was racial equity listening sessions around the country with some colleagues of mine back in early 2017. I believe it was around February of 2017 that we started having these conversations. And we really wanted to understand what was happening around racial equity for domestic and sexual violence survivors and really for all of us. And so there is a PDF of this report. I sent the PDF over to um, someone from Wixap this morning. So if you all want the PDF of this report, it is a great report. Um, it has, not only do we break it up into three parts. So the first part is how we talk about racial equity for survivors. So this is you know, what advocates reported, what executive directors reported, how they're talking about race. The second part really is looking at the cumulative harm of racial bias. And then the third part is how it shows up in the work. And then in the fourth part, there are strategies. And we have case studies throughout the report as well. So it is a great report. We also did a webinar, the YouTube for the webinars in these slides to show people how to actually work with the report. And Kat says, we'll make sure to include it in the email after this today. Wonderful, also with a brief evaluation and your training hours documentation. Great. So one of the things that folks told us was that there is a range of ways that their organization was talking about and acting or not acting to address racial inequity. So some participants, regardless of their own racial identity, 
did not see racial bias and inequity as a significant problem or have an understanding of what the terms even meant. So to me, that is an education issue and that is a problem. You know, when I first came into the work, there seemed to be a lot more opportunities. And I know some of it had to do with funding, probably a lot of it has to do with funding actually. Um, there was a lot more time for education. You know, I was able to read a lot of things and, and, and put ideas together. And now there just seems to be just not that same attention to detail, right? With between social change and domestic and sexual violence, right? Folks should have an understanding about racial inequity for sure um, doing this work. So other people acknowledge concepts like white privilege and racial inequity in theory, but they express discomfort or got defensive when talking about how they show up in real life. And then we had other people who were super eager to talk about it, very excited to talk about it, had lots of depth, experience, and tools, and they offered useful guidance for how they or their organizations have effectively engaged these issues. So it was just a wide range of folks. And so what we did was we highlighted the insights, we highlighted the guidance we got, and the voices of the people that had greater depth in the image below. Right. So we also, again, talked about the cumulative harm of racial bias. There was a lot of conversation about what was happening with refugee and immigrant people, again, because this person here says, after January, we began to notice larger scrutiny of immigrant survivors by the Public Benefits Board in regard to legal status. It's always been challenging here, but a lot more intense now. We've also seen a significant decline in undocumented survivors reaching out for services. So again, that was January, 2017. So I'm sure folks can connect the dots <laughs> about what was happening in, you know, um, around that time and why undocumented people would feel less comfortable reaching out, you know, for services. Folks also talked about the hoops that survivors had to go through when it came to transitional housing, when it came to rapid rehousing, when it came to emergency shelter, financial assistance for rent, utilities and, de and uh, deposits. So there's just a lot of ways that racial bias is showing up in programs. Folks also talked about levels of discomfort and pushback. So one person says, if I have someone on my caseload who is white and I advocate for them to have extended time in the program, it is easily agreed upon. However, if it's a person of color and I'm asking for them to get extended time, I get pushback. That feels very uncomfortable. People also talked about little to no racial or gender representation on the staff, on the board, no people of color in positions of leadership, no policies on racial or gender equity developed. And if there were things, they were um, outdated. And so one of the things that I really got to do a lot of last year was digging into shelter programs, policies and procedures and helping them to be more inclusive and non-racist. Because a lot of times folks just come into the job and they just pick up where the other person left off and they just go on with the work, right? Because there's always a crisis. There's always something to be done. There's no time for nuance so often. Again, not to make anyone wrong, it's the way that our system is set up. And so I got to really dig into those policies. And so folks would say there would be language like everyone has to be respectful, to which I said, well, people can be respectful and be racist, right? We need to change this language. We need to be more explicit, right? Anti-racist actions will not be tolerated, right? Strong language and strong policies. Because like Robin said, you know, the way that we were socialized, the way that we were taught is that racism looks a specific way. So you can't be respectful and be racist Mm, yeah, you can, <laughs> right? So those are 
some of the things that I've actually um, been able to do. The other thing we heard was staff of color seeing their work co-opted or ignored by their white workers being unsafe, right? And this idea of this representation, you know, one of the things I heard a lot is, well, there's just no people of color in our area, or we just can't find good people of color. We've tried. And so one of the things I would say is we need to deepen our networks. We need to become better at finding the right partners. And maybe they're not going to look perfect, but we need to bring them in, right? And the other part of that is I would say, hire them anyway, treat them like white people, hire them anyway and, and train them, mentor them. That's, that's what I've seen happen with my colleagues. I've, I work with lots of people that, <laughs> that weren't necessarily um, the, cream of, the cream of the crop in this work, but they were mentored and they became leaders, right? But so often that doesn't happen with people of color, right? It's just, you get a couple of chances and if you're not stellar, you're out, right? Well, we have this case study. Women of color are fighting loudly in a common space. The advocate, afraid for her own safety, calls the police to intervene. The women are both upset that police were called and blame each other for the fight. One of them is exited after swearing at the advocate for calling the police. So this is a true case study. So let's break it down a little bit more. Two women of color are fighting loudly in a common space. The advocate, afraid for her own safety, calls the police to intervene. The women are both upset that police were called and blame each other for the fight. One of them is edited after swearing at the advocate for calling the police. So what might the consequences be for the survivor who was exited? What might happen to her? Homeless, mm-hmm, yeah, what else? Arrested, ticket or arrested, which might even make her ineligible for services. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. what else? lost her housing, may not be allowed again or allowed into other programs, could impact employment. She may not want to seek services again because she wasn't supported. She might not trust that organization, right? And is there a possibility that she might go back to the person who chose to use harm? Return to the offender. There you go, Catherine. Yep, absolutely. And then who knows what could happen to her, right? What about the person who stayed? the person who got to stay in shelter, what might the consequences be for her? Lack of trust in organization because it might happen to them in the future. Potentially fearful that this could happen to her. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Labeled as problematic or combative. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And so, And again, I used to do conflict resolution trainings in shelter, and I know that it can be really, really challenging. So this is in no way to underestimate how things can get dangerous, right, in shelter, because it can. And at the same time, given this conversation about race, what is the difference between being uncomfortable versus actually being unsafe. physical threat versus unused to certain actions by other people, the consequences. Mm -hmm. 
certain actions by other people, right? Remember one of the things that we talked about early in this conversation was passive aggressiveness, certain ways of being, things being done correctly, and what happens to the people who act outside of that, how they are labeled, how they are treated. And I'm still waiting for a large scale investigation on the numbers of women of color that are exited from shelter. I'm very curious about that. So before I move on, I wanna just see if there are any questions, anything that was unclear um, before I go on. So how do you think advocates should be trained to address notice conflict when it comes to race and racial conflict? What do you all think? Do you think they should be trained to address conflict or notice conflict? when it comes to race and racial conflict. Self-awareness and responses to conflict and race. Yeah, you know, actually in that book, White Rage, there is a chapter on uncomfortability. That's actually really, really good. So yeah, self-awareness around responses mm -hmm, to conflict and race. Mm -hmm. What about other folks? Becoming aware of what the reason is for discomfort. Mm -hmm. Training on alternatives to calling the police for conflict resolution or de-escalation. Oh, that's really good. I think about this a lot around CPS mandatory reporting. Like when you are in crisis, you hurry to respond and it's not thoughtful. It's true. Because that's our first response, right? Our first response is to get somebody to intervene. Certainly we don't want advocates intervening. That's for sure. We don't want them getting in the middle of people, although I know it, it happens. <laughs> but we, we definitely don't want that. Rochelle, you said yes. Are you saying yes to what Michelle said or Sue or everyone? To everyone in regards to thinking before we are calling the police and recognizing a lot of the interpersonal conflict with somebody else the police aren't going to be able to help in a situation like that it's just going to escalate the parties mm -hmm. yeah absolutely self-awareness of how you are enculturated concerning anyone that is darker than white people yeah absolutely Absolutely. Yep. And so I'd love to hear from you all about some historical blocks or barriers that are unique to your agency that might prevent folks of color or underserved populations from coming to or obtaining services. So what are some blocks?
no one on staff. Okay. Defaulting to white guilt. Screenings. What do you mean by screenings? Deciding that because not enough black survivors came for services, it wasn't important or worth the time to ensure services were safe, appropriate, tailored for black survivors. Or outreach, support group screenings, shelter screenings, and the questions and how they're framed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, these are great. And I wonder if these are things that you all are talking about as leaders, like are you utilizing each other, the folks on this call to hash some of these things out? Visible preference for white clients. Board leadership are often people in the criminal legal system. The community may or may not know that, but it impacts services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. So I hope that again, you all utilize each other. Um, you know, I did an executive director's training, well, a couple <laughs> last year, but right there on the call, you know, um, one ED took herself off mute and she was like, I don't know what to do. Um, where should I start? And there were other folks on the call that were like, hey, we're, we're having this group, we're hashing these things out. And right there, they gave each other emails and so that they could work together. The organization is engaged in dialogues on what changes need to be made within the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it would be great again if, if leaders could talk to each other as well. That's always helpful because it's time to make some new agreements, you know, to do things differently. Heinz says, discovering the balance to empowering clients and teaching clients the skills to be empowered without judgment. One of the things that Adrienne Marie Brown talks about is the fact that matter doesn't disappear. Oh, that's great. Monthly director calls we host can definitely be used for these discussions. Yeah, I agree so that you can figure out how to transform some of this, right? Obviously we can't do anything about what's already happened, but we can make new agreements on how to do the work going forward, right? So let's get into the components of equitable service provision. So our services need to be more expansive. There needs to be time for folks to do their own work within the movement. You know, we are so good at telling law enforcement what they need to do. The courts, CPS, the media, right? We're so good at telling other entities what they need to do. But it really is time for our work to, you know, and this is what they said, create avenues for conversations with survivors, colleagues, and staff, and acknowledge racial bias and difficulty of navigating the systems, right? We really need to do our own work, right? And ask these questions, to what extent and who at every level of an organization is carving out space to allow that wisdom that is generated from partnerships to really infuse the organization? Again, they're just has to be a reorientation that this conversation is part of our work. Because one of the pieces about this also is the people that are closest to the problem are people that are gonna be closest to the solution. So if we actually have people at the table earlier, then that can take some of the work off of us, right? So another aspect of equitable services is really looking at our language, looking at how we talk to each other. So one of the things that I've done is I've stopped referring to people, well, I stopped referring to people as perpetrators a long time ago, 
but even calling people batterers, I've, I've used more of the restorative justice language of the person that chose to use harm. And so from that framework, you're talking more about the behavior and you're not labeling the person. And so, you know, our language just does not resonate with communities so often. And it really can shut people out. And it really also can limit our thinking as leaders. You know, transforming our language challenges us to create an expanded vision of our work. Like I told you, I am always pulling apart language, right? We don't always have to say everything perfect and correct. Remember, that is a function of an old system to constantly make us think we have to say everything right all the time. Right? And so our language feeds right into that, right? Somebody said something. Yeah, what is an ad? What even is an advocate? I don't know. <laughs> it's true. I don't know. It's probably in my bio, though, Michelle. <laughs> Please. Don't make me take that word out, <laughs> but really, in all seriousness, right? It's just, again, you know, I joined the work, people were using acronyms, I started to use the acronyms, right? It, and it's also a level of um, separation, right? Client, victim, advocate, director, it, it has a separating effect, right? It's like, I'm the advocate, you're the survivor, you're the victim, I'm here to empower you. Right. So really, again, just thinking about our language and the ways that, you know, the racism and the patriarchy is woven all up in there. So when we start thinking about transformational language, it is a language that is it is survivor and community centric. It is informed by a social justice framework and it is trauma informed and really presents an alternative to an over reliance on the criminal justice system language. So when we're focusing on the community and the survivor, again, we're looking at their knowledge, their creativity, their resources, and their expertise, right? And it, it comes from the top down, right? So the more that you all as leaders free yourself to take on some of this, obviously it will trickle down to staff as well. You know, I have done, I, I talked in the last conversation about I used to do trainings with stop administrators and it looks like I'll probably be doing it again. Um, and I used to do this exercise with them where it was uh, resiliency mapping and I would have them map out different resiliency factors in the communities of color that they're supposed to be, you know, funding coalitions and other organizations to serve. And they couldn't name any other resiliency factors other than the church. And the church isn't for everybody at this point in history, right? And so other than that, that's all they could say. And so it's like, if you don't even know what a community's resiliency factors are, if you don't know what their expertise is, then how are you funding organizations to do the work? Oh, I know, you're checking boxes and they're checking boxes, right? They say, yes, we serve everybody, you say, okay, and give them the money, right? And so one of the things that we have them do we started to um, have them ask how folks were serving the community and not if, but how. Who are the stakeholders that you're working with? We, you know, we had them, and a lot of them changed their RFPs to make it competitive, to make people list, again, how they're actually serving people. Because these are things that we have to do. So the social justice framework addresses the dynamics of oppression, privilege, and all the isms. And it recognizes that society is a product of institutionally sanctioned stratification and group lines that were constructed around race, gender, class, and ability. And it's also trauma informed, right? The social justice framework is, is reflecting on how people, policy, practices, and institutions can empower rather than re victimize communities. And it's also trauma-informed. So my definition of trauma-informed programs, organizations, systems, is one that incorporates the historical and current oppression and all forms of racism and its pervasiveness and the experience of trauma 
and its impact into every aspect of its practice or programs. Because just, you know, I'm a survivor. So I experienced racism from law enforcement when I was a survivor. So if I come to a program and they don't have an understanding of, and I'm not saying that people have to be experts and people, you know, uh, no, but there has to be some level of interest. There has to be some level of acknowledgement. There has to be some sort of recognition of the lives of people of color, because how are you going to serve me effectively? Yeah, I might get some great referrals. I might even go through the program. I might even get transitional housing, but is it taking me to that liberation, right? A trauma-informed approach also recognizes that not only are the people being served potentially affected by the trauma, but staff members may be as well, which, you know, thank goodness now more of us are talking about community care in organizations. I feel like we still have a long way to go around that so that we can be well and do this work, right? It's really hard to take people somewhere we haven't gone ourselves. If I'm feeling powerless at work, if I'm feeling you know, overworked, it's just super hard to give that to another person, right? And lots of advocates and, and you all as well, I'm sure you give and give and give to everybody else. And then it's like, we miss our doctor's appointments, right? So a trauma informed approach recognizes all of those things. And then it's intersection, equitable service are intersectional. So I'm going to play this video from Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom between teachers and students between students and other students between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students regardless of their identities identity isn't simply a self-contained unit it is a relationship between people in history people in communities people in institutions so schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school, for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. she's talking about that within schools obviously it applies to our work and for me I didn't have the language of intersectionality when I joined this movement but devouring all of the information when I first entered it I was able to see how different things intersected and impacted me being a survivor, right? Experiencing violence. And once I was able to look at social factors and all of those things, it helped me in my healing process, right? And so all of these components that I'm sharing with you are components that I've shared with other survivors that I've worked with, but also all of the things that I did for myself to heal myself from 
the trauma that I experienced, right? So these aren't things that I just kind of read and, and threw into a PowerPoint. These are actually, these are actually, you know, tried and true components. Right? And I just love this quote. So when we talk about the language of transformation and leadership, Maynard Bruceman says, one of the most powerful questions you can ask yourself is, do I inspire people to want to change and innovatively solve significant problems? And what does it take to transmit bold new ideas to people who don't want to hear them? And that reminds me of, you know, when I first started the work and I used to talk about, you know, violence all the time with my friends and they never wanted to hear about it, you know? And it was probably the way I was transmitting it. And again, that was 2000, so the world was, you know, quite different. Then, now, they're talking about a lot of things and posting things on social media that I said to them 20 years ago, not quoting me, of course, <laughs> quoting other people, right? So it's like, how do we transmit these bold ideas to people, right, who don't want to, who don't want to talk about the things that you know, we want to talk about and the things that we want to change. And so these are the questions that, you know, I ask myself all the time. But one of the things I know is that we have examples of transformational language and transformational leadership in our work. And so one of the examples is the why. And I love this example because it's all of the steps that they did over time. So in 1946, they began working for integration throughout the organization and adopted an interracial charter that established that wherever there is injustice on the basis of race, whether in community, the nation, or the world, our protests must be clear and our labor for its removal vigorous and steady. Then about 30 years later, less than 30 years later, they created one imperative, and that was to thrust our collective power toward the elimination of racism wherever it exists by any means necessary. So using, you know, that, that strong by any means necessary language in the 70s. And then in 2009, they actually updated their mission, and their mission now is eliminating racism, empowering women, and peace, justice, freedom, and dignity. And they have this stand against racism that says the lack of women of color in leadership positions is not just a diversity issue for diversity's sake, it's an equity issue. So this is a great example of how language has changed over time. I also come from a prevention background, doing prevention work. And so one of the things about prevention, so for example, when I worked for the California, it used to be the California Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And then they changed it once we started our prevention work and it became the California partnership to end domestic violence. So we have all of these examples of how to change our language and how to be transformational leaders in our work. We just, you know, have to do it. So the reflection question for you all is, what would transformational language look like within the context of racial equity? So I'm gonna put that in the chat. And let me just make one quick change here. I knew that was gonna happen. I'm gonna put this in the chat. And before I go into being a co-conspirator, I want to pause to see if there's any questions. Anything that was unclear? So I use the language of co-conspiratorship, but lots of folks 
use the ally language. So I want to share this quick video. Hey friends, so I'm trying something different with my setup, and I don't know if it's working, but you will do. Hey friends, so I'm trying something different with my setup, and I don't know if it's working, but you will deal. <laughs> Imagine your friend is building a house and they ask you to help, but you've never built a house before. So it'd probably be a good idea for you to put on some productive gear and listen to the person in charge. Otherwise, someone's going to get seriously hurt. Look, I'm helping. It's the exact same idea when it comes to being an ally. An ally is a person that wants to fight for the equality of a marginalized group that they're not a part of. We need your help building this house, but you probably should listen so you know what to do first. Let's do this. So here are my five tips for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you've had an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on, they can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not going to be fired because I'm straight and I'm not going to be fired because I'm cis. So it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not possible for you to learn if you aren't willing to listen. So you gotta know when to zip up the lip up. I don't know. You get what I mean. But that's the thing that's so cool about social media. There are so many people sharing their stories all around the world and connecting with people that they normally would never get a chance to without the power of the internet. So do your homework. Start reading blogs, tweets, news articles, and stories so that you can get caught up on the issues that are important to the communities that you want to support. Speak up. But not over. If the fight for equality was a girl group, the ally wouldn't be the lead singer or the second lead singer. They'd be Michelle. An ally's job is to support. You want to make sure that you use your privilege and your voice to educate others, but make sure to do it in such a way that does not speak over the community members that you're trying to support or take credit for things that they are already saying. This isn't Mario Kart. Stay in your lane. Realize that you're going to make mistakes and apologize when you do. Nobody's perfect. Unlearning problematic things takes time and work, so you are bound to mess up and trip and fall. But don't worry, you can brush yourself off and get right back up. Back up! Just remember that it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. So when you get called out, make sure to listen, apologize, commit to changing your behavior, and move forward. Last but certainly not least, actually the most important thing on this list, is remember that ally is a verb. Saying you're an ally is not enough. You gotta do the work. One through four. One through four. As always, there are links in the video description box to some of the things I mentioned in this video, along with some resources that have been really helpful for me as I've gone along in my journey to be more conscious. So I want to hear from you in the comments. What are some sites that you suggest checking out? And what are some things that have helped? So, I heard, oh, it's very hard to hear the video. Can you get a link or get the name? Absolutely, so you can share it with staff. Yes, thank you very much. So her name is Cheska Lee. I will definitely put the link in the chat. Um, you know, and I like it. It's it's a it's it's a quick summation of some of the things that, that we've already talked about. But I like her delivery, and she has lots of really interesting videos actually and work that that she does. So I definitely will share it. Look at that; it's already been shared. Cat <laughs> is on the job. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Cat. Great. That's so good. Hey friends. All right. So my I have my I have some additions also, right? As always. So when it comes to our work in particular, so understanding that historical oppression manifests, you know, within our organizations, within organizations created to end violence, right? Intentionally seeking 
new and innovative ways to identify reach and resource underserved, unserved, and inadequately served populations. Look for opportunities to step back and let go of power to amplify other voices. You know, I love when I am in a training or in a meeting and something is said and I don't have to say anything because my co-conspirator is right there that is right on it. It's, it's great when I don't have to do that emotional labor, right? And then respecting the inherent knowledge, resources, and leadership of marginalized communities. And part two of that is partnering with people in meaningful ways, going to them, right? Avoiding tokenism and bringing in enough people so that members of other groups have strength and support and understanding that critical feedback is an essential part of change and we should expect it, right? So partner, incorporate, and expect, right? Feedback is a part of change. It is not to be feared. So here's my other question for you all, which I'll put it in the chat. What would you like your organization to look like in three years? And how do you need to show up differently today in six months and by next year to ensure that your vision materializes? So I'll put those in the chat for you. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear again if you have any questions, any comments, and I'm going to put here are um, the links to the REAP report there in the middle. That is the actual webinar. And there are some other reports, one by WCN, one that came out by the Y that you have, and ways to get in touch with me, but I will also put the information in the chat. Kat says you enjoy her videos. Yeah, I like I like um, Cheska's videos a lot as well. So, yeah, any questions for me? Hi, everyone. Um, this is Sue, and I just want to let you know we're going to turn off the recording for questions so that people can ask questions that would not be posted on our website afterwards. So if people want to ask questions about what's going on in your organization, it will just be information that now is in this session, and obviously we will um, all commit to keeping that.